Welcome back to another episode of Minding My Own Mind. Today we have Cassandra with us and she is a life coach, a woman's coach in so many things, but she can introduce herself better than I can. So welcome, Cassandra. Thank you so much, Michelle, for having me. You know, my middle name is Michelle. Oh, I didn't know that actually. Cool. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for having me. And hello, everyone. My name is Cassandra Austin McDonald. And I like to say I'm a transformational genius and a coach for women, high performing women to activate their power so that you're creating the life, love, leadership and legacy of your dreams in a fulfilling and aligned way. Mm, I love that. I love that. And so what would you say is the main type of person that you're working with then? High performing professional and executive women who are killing it professionally and really high performing go getters. However, start to notice that they could work on their womanhood and their femininity a bit, work on their emotional intelligence and how they're showing up in their relationships, but also their feminine embodiment and leadership, how they're showing up in leadership. Because I have found a lot of high powered women who have not embodied their womanhood and femininity tend to approach leadership from this still very masculine approach and don't realize the power that we have as women to approach it intuitively and from their their power and entrusting and that's good enough instead of feeling like they gotta be like a man mm -hmm. i love that i feel like so many of us are taught that we have to essentially embody masculinity and when we're going into these leadership positions First of all, could you give a quick summary of what you think it means to be in your feminine and masculine energy just for the people who aren't familiar with it? Yeah. So what's interesting is I know it's like a hot topic on these internet streets right now, like feminine and masculine. I actually have very different beliefs about being in feminine and masculine. Uh, I like to look at it as the different hemispheres of our brain. And instead of saying feminine, masculine energies, yin and yang, because those are the dynamics that are really like the the softening and then the strength part. Uh, I feel like the issue is when we start talking about masculine, then the image that comes in our mind is a man. But when we use terms like yin and yang or left and right hemisphere of the brain, we start to realize, oh, we have these dualities of ourselves where we get to lean into one or the other. And it's not about being like a man or being less of a woman. And so that's kind of my unique approach to it. And so for me, being in your feminine womanhood is being connected to your heart, to your spirit, to your essence. Uh, being connected to joy, pleasure, bliss. It's its like the inner game. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you know, a lot of times I hear people talk about feminine and womanhood online and, and all they show is pretty pictures and spa days and looking nice. And although that becomes a byproduct of who you're being internally, that is not actually what it means to be in your feminine womanhood. To me, that just is a byproduct. Being in your feminine womanhood is is a way of being internally first, you know, from, with, from within. And then when we're looking at what people would call masculine or looking at being, using the other side of our brain is more so where that structure comes in, being more strategic, more analytical, more logical, and that is beneficial too, especially as women who are running businesses and women who are in leadership and women who are running households. Like we do need both dynamics. And so that's how I, I like to look at those two different energies. Mm -hmm. I really love the, your concept of relating it with yin and yang. When people see these little yin and yang and they see like the little dots and the black and white. But what I think it's really representing is if you imagine that that line in the middle could just be fluidly moving, it's almost as if the balance is fluidly moving. In certain areas, you may need more of one than the other, but it's continuously in a fluid balance. And I think people don't necessarily take into account that when you're in your feminine energy, you do need your masculine energy in certain areas of your life, just as men and women and whoever, whatever you identify as, you always need a balance of the two. 
So instead of seeing the rest of this conversation for those listeners who are not understanding, basically we are talking about energies and we are not necessarily talking about genders or men and women, but we are talking about energies of masculine and feminine. And so going from there, just to get a little baseline before we go too, or not too deep, but really deep in it because that's what we want to do. Could you talk a bit about the benefits of when women are in their masculine energies? What are the, the key times that we notice that we're in those masculine energies? Uh, it's usually when we're getting things done, when we are being quote unquote productive, we are accomplishing things, we're achieving things, we are doing what's on the to-do list that needs to be done. We may be leading something. But the issue I have found is when we leave our heart out, when we leave our spirit out, when we leave our intuition out, when we leave our joy, our compassion, or our passion, the parts that make us a woman, when we leave that out, it's just like you're just showing up as this cold tyrant of, we just get it done. And who wants to be led like that? You know, I don't. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think I think that's so crucial to take into account, especially when you have a lot of women who are climbing up the corporate ladder or really into being in their careers. And it, we are both entrepreneurs. We both know that in our business world, we are often coming from our masculine energy where we you know we need to get A, B, C, D done. How do we you suggest, because now we can speak a bit more on it, where do you see that change? when women are able to lead from a more feminine zone. So still staying in the workplace, but leading from a more feminine energy. I believe it starts with self-permission. Giving yourself permission to stand for you get to be your full self. I think that there has been for decades this mindset that we have to cut off parts of ourselves when we're entering our profession. And what tends to happen is people, I call it a soul death, where people start to feel like they're losing themselves because they create this professional persona and then there's someone else behind the scenes. But what tends to happen is one or the other is going to win and usually it's the professional persona. And that's when we see people's relationships being compromised, their personal lives being compromised, their joy, their fulfillment, their satisfaction. So it's really coming from a place of self-permission of like, I'm not going to cut off the core of who I am just to climb the corporate ladder or just to make it to the top or stay at the top and trusting yourself. So self-trust is a big piece too, because as women, we're very intuitive. We're highly intuitive. And I found a lot of women struggle with trusting their intuition at higher levels because we they're in roles where logical and analytical thinking is more valued, but our gut is so powerful. And so if you start to anchor in self-trust where you have a gut feeling that a move that you're you and your partner are going to make in business or your executive or whoever you're running a team with and you just have this gut feeling like mm, I think we should go left instead of right and then the evidence later comes up everyone else will start to see the value in that also like you know what she's got an eye or she has an inkling or you know when she gets those nudges we got to listen to her and so it's really you leading, you going first and then allowing everyone else to kind of follow suit. And to me, that's what it means to be a leader is you go first. Mm -hmm. I just thought about when you said that the fact of, OK, you're in this situation with lots of people who are in their masculine energy and they are not necessarily valuing that intuitive part of you. But yeah. can't you feel, especially people who are meant to be more in their feminine energy at times, can't you feel how it feels against you to go with their fully logical side? So they are also in need of you in this way of balancing the entire system, of balancing even that workspace. And when everyone only goes to the logical side, of course, people who are in their logical mind are always going to be like, no, but this works, but this works. But sometimes you need that extra bit who's someone who is going to question, basically, like, I don't know about that. You're, you don't only need to logically question, but you can also use your intuition to question. Exactly. And, and this is how innovation happens. Innovation is very intuitive. It's, it's not just pure logic and analytics. It's, there's an intuitive element to innovation. And so if you're going to innovate uh, a company or if you're going to innovate a process or if you're going to innovate the way that 
the organization you work for is doing things, it actually does require a level of intuitiveness because you're able to see between the lines. You're able to see that one plus one may not equal two in this instance, even though logically it does, you may see like, yeah, but there's something, I'm just something doesn't seem right. And so that is how I believe we innovate when we're connected to that part of ourselves. And so when you cut that part of yourself off in the name of the good old boy system or just fitting in to get along, to get by and do what you got to do, you're actually robbing yourself of shining. You're robbing yourself of shining because when you're the one that's innovating, you're the one that's bringing these brilliant ideas to the table because you're connected to your womanhood, your femininity, your intuition. People will start to value your opinion more because they'll remember the last time you shared something and it worked and then they're going to come to you and they're going to say, wait a minute, let's let's ask her before we do this, because last time she hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. I really love it because when you say innovation, I also think about the word creativity, which is going in alignment with that. That's really putting, you can have all the people in the world that can do the math, that can do the logical things. But if you don't have the creativity within that as well, then how are you actually going to expand into new areas? And we all know this. We've been around those people who can calculate everything, but they also can't see the way around. They can't problem solve as well because they're so into things being logical that they can't see the other opportunities. Exactly. What's interesting is my husband, I call him the mister on these internet streets. He's an engineer and he has a team. He has employees that, that work under him. And he was sharing with me how much he values hiring women because of the intuition and being able to like see perspectives that because the, the, his field is very male dominated. And so being able to have women come in and notice things, especially when we're talking about, you know, the field of engineering, that's very logical, analytical, like, but there are still nuances. And so even just having men in leadership roles that value women and their opinions, you know, is huge. Mm -hmm. Just going on that a little bit, although this may not necessarily be in that feminine energy, more about embracing it in women's environment. How would you encourage women who are in those positions, but a bit more nervous to speak up? How do you encourage them to really embrace that part of themselves? I would say practice. Practice. You know, I know practice makes perfect, sounds cliche, but it's so true. That's how we build self-confidence through repetition, through doing something over and over and over again. And at some point, you're just going to have to put yourself in the game and do it. Are you going to nail it every time? Probably not. However, your courage and your confidence and your your character gets built during those times when you're feeling it out and you're really trying to fill into what this looks like for you. But if you never give yourself that chance, you rob yourself of seeing who you get to be, how much you get to shine, what you're able to create, what you're able to do if you don't just try. And so practice, have some courage and just put yourself in there and try it. Mm-hmm. And so that's for the woman or the person who wants to be more in their feminine energy, who is usually not doing it as much in the workplace. But now let's talk about the women who basically have always been in their masculine and are looking to be more in their feminine. And we know that we have the mainstream version of what it means to be feminine right now, and that you have another further deeper definition. So I'd really love to de dig into that of what about those women who are used to being so into their masculine that are wanting to turn back to balance their energy outside of that. Are you talking about in their personal lives? Yeah, in their personal lives and maybe even offering it within the workplace. Oh, I thought that's what the last question you were yeah. asking was. <laughs> so one of, one of them was for, basically one is for the woman who is already so in her masculine. And then the other one was for the one who is so in her feminine, but trying to have more confidence. So you did answer it correctly, actually, with what the woman wanting to be more confident to share that feminine side of her. What about the woman who is basically heavy on the balance of the masculine energy and has been most of their lives talking about like female athletes, people who have really been competing most of their lives. How do those women one, bring more femininity into their workplace leadership and into their personal lives. I think that it does begin in your personal life with that, 
because that's usually where you're going to feel safer. You're going to feel safer in your personal life to start to relax and lean back a little bit and settle into, I call it our sacred self, which I believe is like this divine part of ourself, the God within, the Holy Spirit within, whatever your beliefs are, but learning how to be in more stillness so you can actually access your own voice and not the voice in your head, <laughs> but the voice in your heart, in your soul and your spirit. And I, it, it takes practice being sitting with yourself. And then once you start to cultivate, I call it a sacred practice, you know, having a sacred practice where mm-hmm. you're consistently spending time with yourself, with the creator, you're sitting with yourself, you're connected within and you're leading from your heart and then start to over time, you can start bringing that into the workplace of, you know what, I have this idea that came from your intuition, not from you looking at the numbers or looking at the data. It was more intuitive. So I, I believe it starts with really with you first. I uh-huh. to say wherever you go, there you are. And if you're going to try to do something like that at work, I think it's best to do it where you feel safest as, which is home with yourself. Mm-hmm. And then cultivate sacred practices where over time you're you're nurturing that part of yourself and then it, it starts to become more natural. Mm-hmm. I really think about when it comes to the workplace and the thing you said earlier about practice makes perfect. It's also that if you stop practicing certain things, that those things will go away. And for me, with the practice makes perfect, I could see where most of my life I hadn't been training. Um, I was an athlete. I was training to be competitive all the time. I was still playing sports. Most of the time I still play sports now, but I'm not nearly as competitive now. And what I realized is when I took that step back from being competitive for maybe like the past six months, I felt a huge shift in my own energy. And although I can turn my more intense doing energy to more masculine energy on when it comes to my work, which it takes more practice to get back into that flow, I was able to also step back and become more feminine in my regular life and be able to learn what it meant to take a step back and just be. So what would you suggest to people who are still competing, women who are still dealing with these day-to-day things, how they can balance more in their personal life, especially when it comes to relationships? I totally understand what that's like because I was also a competitive athlete. I was a division one track and field athlete, highly competitive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it still comes like sometimes. <laughs> There was a contest. Your girl was trying to win it. Okay. <laughs> Dude, still lost one guy. Still there. I get it. It is. And you know, this is the thing. I believe in harmony, not balance. And so I believe in, in finding harmony with all the parts of ourselves. I believe we have different parts of ourselves. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having a competitive edge. I think the issue is when you take that in every room you enter. And so it's really starting to learn how to navigate the different parts of yourselves based on the room you're in and who you're with. You know, if you're with your partner, you don't want to be Miss Corporate Badass. You don't want to be, I'm about to get on the starting line and try to smoke everybody out on this track. (laughs) You know, so it's really starting to learn how to feel within yourself. Like, what does it feel like to be in the zone, competitive, really trying to kill it and win it. And then what does it feel like to have my heart open and to be vulnerable and to connect? And then what does it feel like to have fun and be playful and be adventurous? It's like really starting to connect with these different parts of ourselves and being more conscious and aware. I think a lot of times people are running on autopilot. They are just so used to being one dimensional. We forget that we're multifaceted, multidimensional human beings. And so they're just used to just always being in charge, always being in control, always being competitive, always. And so you enter every room that way, but you're so much more than that. There's so much more to you than that. So it's really like turning your conscious awareness on and starting to notice who am I being when I enter this room? Mm -hmm. Who am I being as a mother? Who am I being as a partner? Who am I being as a leader? And starting to feel into that. Mm Mm-hmm. I think it's so much about that self-awareness and deciding that you want to do something different. 
And I think even with the vulnerability thing you were talking about, I think people in those competitive zones aren't used to playing in the vulnerability zone. Thinking most no. people are. That was something that took a lot of, I call it heart work and soul work, where we are cranking ourselves open from within our heart, our soul, our spirit. And for me, I actually spent a lot of my early adult years in a very hardcore, high achieving, get after it type of way, but it, it kept leading to cycles of burnout. And over time, I started to realize that this is not sustainable, it's not fulfilling, and I really desire to connect with my womanhood, with my femininity. And so it took practice, it took time for me to sit with the discomfort. It, is, it does feel really uncomfortable when you are not used to being open and vulnerable. But if you can have the courage to sit through that over time, it starts to become more normal and you build the most beautiful connections with other people. I find a lot of, especially black women and women of color, my clients who are black women struggle the most with vulnerability, mm -hmm. the most. And it's the very thing that is robbing us of connection, of true relationships, of being seen for all of who we are, not just a go-getter and a hyper achiever. And so I like to say in my work, I like to have people shift from being a high achiever to a high performer, because I believe that there's a difference between the two. And when you can shift into high performer, you're not, you're not just in this competitive hyper achievement mode 24 seven, you know, when you're performing and you know, when you're not. Mm -hmm. Love that. Love that. I've never heard that. So I really love hearing that one. That's a great <laughs> one. And going into that, um, looking at, of course, like women of color that have to deal with these pressures and women just dealing with pressures for the mere, the mere existence of being a woman. We already have so many things. How would you suggest that those people who are carrying that strong woman narrative, how would you suggest that they work on that with, while trying to reach that place where they feel more vulnerable or allowed to feel more vulnerable. I, I always say the first step is once you're aware that you're being that way is to acknowledge and give yourself permission to start shifting into doing something different. And so it can start with a conversation with the person you feel like you can trust and you feel safest with whoever that person is and just say, Hey, I've noticed that I show up this way in my life and this is something I really want to work on. You know, I'm, I'm going to start practicing with you to be more vulnerable. Are you okay with that? And that was actually how I navigated vulnerability in my life. I found the closest friend I felt safest with. And I told her, I realized that I'm always in this really high achieving mode and I'm always in my head a lot. And I realized that it's, messing up my relationships and I don't feel fulfilled at work. And I felt like my creativity was shot and I just was vulnerable and said, like, I really want to work on this. Can I just start practicing with you? And it was messy at first. I didn't always nail it. You know, sometimes I, it just didn't come out right. However, in that over time, I learned how to be more comfortable with it. And it's just become a way of being now. Mm -hmm. Really like that idea of choosing someone specifically. I feel like and the way that I often speak on and you as well, that you need to be who you're wanting to become and be who the other person may also need to be. But usually as the strong woman, we may be the only strong person or the safe space for everyone else, but not everyone else is always offering us that safe space. So I think it's very important to look deeper into that as well. So who are you choosing and making sure that you also are not taking on the strong woman arrow so much that you're being taken advantage of or that you're just not getting anything from it. Exactly. I, I really am a huge advocate for reciprocal relationships. And I often say that I retired my superwoman cape a long time ago. <laughs> yes. Dang, I always knew we're one that burned it up is gone, you know. Uh, but for me, it, it really was about acknowledging that I was showing up that way and being very vulnerable with the people in my life. You know, when I was not okay, say that. When I needed to be supported, say that. 
when I didn't have the capacity and the bandwidth within myself to hold space for someone else, say that. Don't just push through and try to be there for everyone because people expect you to be. When my husband and I relocated to Florida three and a half years ago, I went through a huge solitude season for me to recalibrate and readjust to that transition. And I straight up told people, I don't have the capacity for anyone else's ish right now. I just don't. And mm -hmm. so this is where you have to be honest with the people in your life and stop trying to hide like you got it all together and stop trying to pretend that you're perfect and stop trying to pretend like, you know, every everything in your life is okay. Like if you have things that are happening, open yourself up because people treat you how you teach them to te treat you based on what you allow and what you don't allow. And so if you're showing up to your relationships in this very hardcore, I've got my ish together, I don't need any help. It's usually because you don't want to be seen. And that vulnerability piece may feel scary because you're afraid of, what if I get judged? What if I get rejected? What if I get abandoned? But those very fears are actually robbing you of deeper, meaningful connections. And so it's going to require some courage, but it, it's worth it if you can push through that initial fear and resistance. Absolutely. I think it's so crucial to realize just because you can doesn't mean you should. So just because I can hold a safe space for a lot of people doesn't mean I have to. And I think the strength is coming from that boundary of saying, I can't do that. And one thing you really mentioned there was like just better communication, like say it and choose yourself first because you're the one in charge of your life in the end. Exactly. I find a lot of, I, I have a part of my framework that, that I talk about often is conscious communication. And I find a lot of people just don't communicate effectively. And we make a lot of assumptions that people can read our mind. People should just know they should be able to read our vibe. And it's like, no, my dear, we've got to communicate and we have to be open and tell people what's really going on. No, not the surface, not the answer that sounds good, but really be open and honest about what's really going on and, and deliver it in a way where it can be received. Mm -hmm. I think that's so, that's so conscious of you to say, and so many people don't think about that deeper because they are not yet ready also to listen to someone telling them the same thing. So you have to be ready to, it's not even dishing out, but you have to be ready to respect that someone else is setting that boundary. Half the time we get frustrated at other people setting boundaries because we couldn't set our own. Because when you start setting exactly. your own, you're like, ah, that sucks. Okay. We can continue because that I respect your boundaries. I think it's hardest for the people who don't respect boundaries or the people who don't have boundaries are the ones who get the most upset when you choose to set the example of doing it. Yeah, I have definitely found that in my life whenever I have set a boundary, the people who really, really struggled with it, they were the ones who had no boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the people who respected my boundaries were the ones who had boundaries. Yeah. And so you, we really become a mirror of one another. And a lot of times that's not easy to hear because we don't want to hear that our relationships are mirroring back to us who we're being or not being. Our businesses are mirroring back to us who we're being or not being, or our career or our family or whomever. We don't, it doesn't feel good to hear that. However, there's a lot of truth that gets to be unraveled in that to see like, where do I get to rise into more of my power? Where, I, where do I get to grow in this area? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so going back a bit, talking about relationships. So you were talking about womanhood and leadership. But I want to go back and talk a little bit about relationships. And I know that you have the story of how you manifested your mister. Maybe we can dive a little bit into that. And then also how you stepping into your womanhood really helped with that. Oh, my gosh. I was a totally different woman when I met him. <laughs> oh, when I say I feel like I was so savvy. <laughs> <laughs> by the time I met him I felt like I cracked all the codes where I was like mm -hmm. I know how to do this thing like I had spent I would say all of my 20s figuring out womanhood and dating and relationships and love and romance and I learned how to discern the difference between emotional decisions versus intuitive decisions. I find a lot of women struggle with that. They can't tell the difference between the two and what it feels like in their body. And I had mastered this 
to the point where I was meeting really successful potential partners who had really successful careers, some doctors and attorneys and business owners, but I could feel in my intuition was like, that's a no, Mm -mm. it's not aligned. And so by the time I met him, I had felt like I was in this beautiful relationship with myself, beautiful relationship with myself. And it, it felt like it was complete divine timing. It was complete divine timing that we we met when we met. We met on 8-8, August 8th. I have so Ooh. much synchronicity about the number eight. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, identity, okay. <laughs> it was so magical. <laughs> but uh, I'll share a little bit of my background and story if that's okay. And when, so okay, so I got pregnant with my son at 19 when I was in college and I realized after I had my son, that his father was basically a replica of my father. And my father was a, an abusive alcoholic addict. And so when I realized that I was recreating a relationship dynamic that I grew up in and witnessed between my parents, I was like, what the heck just happened? And that's when I started learning about trauma bonds. And so we're talking about two decades ago before this stuff was even being talked about. And I was learning about this stuff. And my I went to a campus counselor at the time and she was telling me that this is a trauma bond and what was your relationship like with your parents and how was your home growing up? And I was like, wait, what? Like I was, so, my brain was just like, what? <laughs> I was like, I thought I was being intentional because when I left my my home, I was 16 when I left. I swore I would never be like my parents. I swear I would never have a relationship like theirs. It would, I would never have a toxic, dysfunctional relationship. And so I couldn't understand how, even with my highest intentions, I still attracted this person in this relationship into my life. And so this is when I realized how deep this stuff really goes. And I did not stay with his father, of course, and it led me down my own sacred path of first inner healing and trauma work and then self-love and then, you know, self-discovery and all the ways that it unravels and then eventually my womanhood and femininity and really learning how to connect with my intuition and knowing the difference between my emotions and my intuition. And so what was interesting is the day I met my husband, I felt it. We hadn't even had a conversation yet. And I saw him from across the room and we like connected eyes and I felt something on the inside. I will never forget that feeling as long as I live. And I was like, whoa, who is that? What is this that's going on inside of my body? (laughs) And it was so funny because we connected and he was sitting at the same table as I was. It was like one of those round tables and we were at a birthday party celebration, one of my childhood friends invited me to a birthday party with her colleagues. And she was the only person I knew at this event. And so I didn't know anybody else at this event. And it was a whole bunch of engineers and their partners at this event. I didn't know anyone. I just knew her. It was so funny because I actually didn't want to go because the day before I had just flown back from Florida picking my son up from his dad and his granddad. And I was really upset and irritated at his dad because he was just, you know, co-parenting, doing the most. Listen. And so I was feeling agitated and I was like, I don't know about this. Like, I, I just don't feel like being bothered right now, but I still went. And me and him are sitting across the table from each other and we're having a conversation and we're just connecting and talking back and forth. And I noticed there was this chair that was empty right next to me. And I tapped it and I said, why don't you come over here and sit by me? (laughs) So sweet, so sweet. And of course he came and sat by me. (laughs) And then you got married. (laughs) And he, uh, he asked me for my number. Because after this event, everyone was going to, it was called Stella Blue at the time. And it was this really cool, like, lounge type of area where, you know, people more like in their 30s would go and listen to good music, have drinks, you know, have a good time. And he was asking, are we going? Like, are you going to this next thing? I was like, I don't know. I got stuff to do. And my friend was like, come on, let's go. Because she was liking his friend. 
And she was like, girl, we done met some people. We need to get let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Teamwork makes his dream work. <laughs> yeah. So we went and me and him danced all night long. And we we talked. I remember that night I overheard him tell one of his friends, there's something about her. She's special. I, I overheard him tell his friend that. And so it's like, I feel like we knew since day one. And he's been calling me every day since. Oh, it's so cute. It's so cute. So when you had been in that stage, you think it was your feminine intuition that had led you up to that point? Or what do you think you had worked on that made you more, most ready for when he was coming into your life? Oh, everything. Everything. The trauma work, the relationship with myself, uh, learning how to be a woman, um, my emotional intelligence, working on my conscious communication, uh, really having a real grounding in who I am and knowing that I, I told him the day we met that I was at the time I was I was writing my trauma memoir that I self published seven years ago. And I told him, like, you know, I'm writing this book. My my calling comes first. I'm always going to put I feel like it's a God thing. And he just he's always respected that. And so it's like I have this really groundedness. Like, I know who I am. I know what I've been placed on this planet to do. And I desire to have a partner. Uh, and so I was just very like I knew who I was. I was in my I was in my own essence. Mm -hmm. I think that just reflects so much on the importance of just working on yourself and healing. I think even for myself, not to get off topic, but when I am fully in my healed, most like Michelle. Yes, I love Michelle, not in an arrogant way, but in just like a I love me way. I feel the most attractive. I feel the most happy. I feel the most everything. And you can feel your energy shift when you're in those states. Exactly. And I, I genuinely could say that when I met him at that time, I was probably in the best place I had ever been in my life as a woman, as an adult, everything. Like I was in a really, really good place. I had been working on myself all the way around, like my finances. I had gotten myself out of debt and was saving and investing like I completely transformed my life mm -hmm. and so it was like of course I attracted this man into my life because of who I became mm -hmm. I think it also puts so much perspective into not saying that people need to be alone because I don't think you need to be alone I think we actually do need people but allowing that space of not making it a dependency allowing that space of two becoming pulled together and being whole as yourself, but also being up, the word would, you are upgrading your life. You're upgrading your life by coming together, but it doesn't mean that you were downgraded before. Precisely, precisely. And I strongly believe in interdependence. Uh, I believe that a lot of women are stuck in this independent, like miss independent and hyper independence can actually be a trauma response. Mm -hmm. Feeling like you don't need anyone, feeling like you can do it all by yourself, feeling like you don't need help, you don't know how to ask for help. That's actually a trauma response. And so when we can learn how to be interdependent, it means that we can hold on to ourselves, we can hold on to our own authenticity, our own identity, and we can receive. And that's mm -hmm. where the receivership comes in for fe being a feminine woman. Yeah, I think that's so, so crucial. So crucial, especially being able to not i think we're taught so much about being independent especially if you had a single uh parent home or when you are basically scared of being vulnerable and open again you get to this stage of i don't need anyone and i am very independent but i'm not gonna sit here and say i don't need anyone that i don't want a relationship that i don't want these things and when you're walking around saying that all the time you're going to be gearing yourself towards that, right? What you say is what you're going towards. So if you're saying, I don't need no man. I can do it all by myself. Yeah, I can do it by myself, but I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. I I have always, even when I was single, I had male friends and I would let them come to my home and help me fix things in my house. And I have always been like, come help me. Come help me. <laughs> Oh, don't tell Lindsay at this hearing help. That was one of the best things I ever learned how to do. Receive some help. Over here. 
Yes. This is like, yes. <laughs> I will re- gladly receive that help. Okay. Well, I'm not too proud. <laughs> yeah. But I believe that's how I attracted my husband. Mm-hmm. The, he, this man, he probably could build a house if he wanted to. Like, he's so handy. And uh, I don't have to worry about certain things. You know, if my car needs an oil change, he'll like see, like, oh, we got to go get your oil change or we got to do this. Like, I don't have to worry about certain things. And so, me being in this relationship has actually helped me to deepen into my feminine womanhood because I was a single mom when I met him. And so I was very much still having to balance these two different dualities and energies because I was being the mother and the father. I I use that loosely, but I, I had to show up in dual ways as raising my son as a single mom. And so being in this relationship with my husband has really helped me to learn how to even soften my edges even more and how to lean back even more into my womanhood and femininity, but also when do I lean forward in my business and as a leader? Mm -hmm. I find it so interesting when you were talking because you took the the words right out of my skin when you were talking about how when he is stepping into his masculinity, it allows you to step more into your femininity. And I can say I've experienced the exact same thing where I had an ex who is hyper masculine, super masculine, but not in a demanding way. In a natural, his mere existence is already in his masculinity. And by being with him, I finally understood what it was like to just naturally have my feminine side come in. And what I realized is that if you're dating people and not allowing that space, then you're going to feel like you're in your masculine all the time. And then that the men really have to come in and not just expect that we're going to change, especially if we've been independent this whole time. But if you're really looking to have that balance of masculine and feminine, if you really want it to be in a certain way, I think it's so crucial to know, like, I can be in my feminine when you allow me to. But you have to create that safe space for the number to lean to it. Exactly. And that's that's key right there is I felt the safest with my husband more than anybody I've ever been in a relationship with. I've been able to heal even more in this relationship for the work that I've been called to do. And it's because of the safety that I have felt in this relationship. And, you know, I was, as you were sharing, I was thinking about how I've heard from women before who will say that they feel like either they are the one pursuing when they're dating or they're the one who is leading in their homes if they're already partnered. And often I like to, I like to highlight to them that they are in that forward leaning, like trying to control the outcome, trying to get someone to do. And, and, and in that, the other person is going to respond accordingly. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, if you feel like your partner is being too quote unquote feminine, and that's not the dynamic you want, at some point, you're going to have to be the one to start leaning back because mm-hmm. if you don't, what what tends to happen when we're talking about male and and women gender, men will start to result into being like a little boy because they feel like they're being mothered. Mm-hmm. And with that, that's where you see these dynamics come out that you feel like that you're mothering your partner. But they blame the partner and say that, oh, he, he's not picking up his socks off the floor. He's always playing this video game or He's always, and it's like, but you're mothering him. Mm-hmm. So of course he's doing that. Cause when he was a kid and his mom said, get your, get your socks off the floor, turn that game off. He goes into whatever mind he went into as a kid. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of women don't even realize that they're showing up that way in these different dynamics. And that's why they're ex- having these experiences because that is how powerful energy is. Mm-hmm. I would love for you to talk a bit about more about energy, you know, that you brought it up talking about bringing those energies into all the spaces and your suggestions on the discernment part. I think some people are ready to allow that, but where do they need to use more judgment and which one they're going to be embodying in that moment? So, so what do you mean by that? When you say discernment in the energies, tell me. So in the examples of them being in the household and doing these things, how do they make that shift? For example, I see it as during the dating stages, 
is what is going to lay out for the future. So if you're wanting to have someone who's going to be more in their masculine, you also have to prioritize and pay attention to the fact that it's like, okay, if I'm trying to be in my feminine and they keep forcing me into my masculine, is this really the situation that I want? Is this where I'm going to be continually pursuing and then taking responsibility for your decisions? In that? Yeah. I'm actually thinking about a client I worked with that comes to mind. Uh, she's a wife. They, they have two kids. She's running like a multiple six figure, probably close to seven figure company now. And in very much so like boss, you know, getting it done. And so when she came to me, we straight focused on her first before we focus on the dynamics in the relationship. And so I always tell women, focus on yourself first, because we are so powerful that when we enter a room in our embodied essence and confidence, we can shift the dynamics in the room. And so anytime the mister and I are having a little snafu in our relationship, I can always pinpoint where you, you've been overdoing something or you skipped out on your sacred practices two days in a row, so you're disconnected. And anytime I get back reconnected and I'm filling in my embodied womanhood, the dynamics shift again. And I don't have to say a word. And he's being how I would love him to be. That's how powerful we are as women. We don't always have to say something. It's who we're being in the room. And so first you have to work on who are you being before you even open your mouth? What is your energy like? Are you, do you have attitude? Because folks can, folks can feel it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have to say anything. You walk around with an attitude and your hand on your hip and you huffing and puffing like, you know. And so this is where you got to come back to who are you being? And then we can work on shifting the dynamics in the relationship if it hasn't already shifted. But if you focus on yourself first, I would not be surprised if, some dynamics start shifting in that relationship. Mm -hmm. I recently was talking to someone, actually a guy, about how powerful women are. And I also talked to as my coworker. What I think is that somewhere along the lines, we as women get told we have no power. And I remember this guy saying it so clearly. And I was like, wow, didn't even think about it that way. He was saying, women have all the power. He's like, they can literally change anything. He's like, if you look at what guys do, Everything they do is geared towards getting a woman. Yep. Everything is about getting a woman. And although it seems from the other side sometimes that we're like fighting over guys, I mean, look at how many men are in the world and how many women are only going after a small percentage. Like the the power the women have is so strong. However, somewhere along the lines that we just forgot about it completely or we were told that it doesn't exist and we've gone yeah. to this stage and I think that's something that's so important in the work that we both do where it's like re-empowering the woman and realizing like go be that powerful woman go have that powerful feminine energy because that's actually significantly more than you're currently giving it credit for so could you expand on that a bit at all yeah i i first want to clarify the the difference of the power because i think sometimes when people hear power they hear force yeah and yeah. In this, in this essence, we're not talking about like forceful power. We're talking about personal power. And personal power is where you are in like your feminine flow. You're in your courage. You're in your confidence. Uh, you're in your intuition. It's different. And I, I always like to clarify that because when we hear certain words, it sometimes triggers certain thoughts in our mind. And then we, we think we got to go be this way. And so mm -hmm. we're not saying go be forceful. What we're saying is your presence is enough. You're mm -hmm. powerful in being who you are, but it's in the forcing where we tend to kill the vibe and overdo it. And <laughs> yeah, when you're in the forcing, you're going into the masculine energy. You're going into the doing energy. the The power we're talking about is in the being. The power we're talking about is in the your existence is already in the power. But when you try to go force things. You're going yes. against you just being. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so it's it's really, it's a, it's a perspective shift for sure. And really understanding the difference between are you being or are you doing and knowing when is, when, it, when is needed, what is needed and when. 
because oftentimes you can find yourself trying to overdo in a dynamic that's not necessary. And we can be like a human magnet, literally. Mm-hmm. Like I, I wrote this beautiful post the other day on my Facebook after an, an interaction with the mister and I were literally like, I we were standing in the kitchen and I just, I just felt like, I just felt something in my heart. And I was like, oh, like I felt like I wanted him. I felt, des- I desired him. And he just leaned over and kissed me. Like it was like, we are magnets. I didn't mm-hmm. say a word. I didn't ask him to do anything. I didn't lean into him. I was just being, and I received. That is how powerful we are. And I know some people may be hearing this like, what the heck is she talking about? (laughs) (laughs) But if you can just start to be more curious about what it means to trust that you are enough and that who you are is enough and that you have magic inside of you and and just be curious start with curiosity because we're not talking about being a pro at this overnight we're talking about just lean in with a little bit of curiosity and start to play with it experiment it's it's no different than anything new that we do you know when we were kids and we were learning how to ride a bike some people had to learn with training wheels and some people would just go out there and scruff their knees but eventually you learned how to ride the bike and so this is no different than trying anything new that you've done in your life you just lean in with some curiosity absolutely i love that magnet story because i actually even considered naming one of my programs magnetic energy because i'm so into this concept when you are just being when you have fully embraced who you are and your energy and all these things and that the world is just around you you see the magnetic parts happening. Like if you just pay attention, it's happening. You can feel people being drawn to you. You can feel people wanting to do things for you when you didn't even ask. And I just find it so fascinating, but you have to get to know yourself. You have to stop seeking outside validation. You have to start healing. You have to become fully yourself and embrace that power by just being because it, the world will start to shift in your favor when you allow it. Precisely, precisely. And so this was a fantastic talk today. I don't want to take too much of your time. We will definitely do this again. But I would love for you to share one last thing that you feel like the people, the women, the men, whoever's listening, what you would like them to know and take away today. Just the power of being a woman and how we get to be with who we love. We get to do work that we love. We get to live a life that we love all at the same time when we're not cutting off parts of ourselves and trying to save the day and try to be everything to everyone and nothing to ourselves. And so I know that it may feel like it's challenging at times to lead this way, but I lead a me first in my life. I come first as a, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a leader, I'm, I'm a business owner. I come first because I realized if I'm no good, I can't be any good to anyone or anything else in my life. And it completely has shifted my life and it continues to shift. Even during the times I fall off a little bit, when I lean back into me first, everything falls into line after that. Mm-hmm. And the absolute last question that I love asking everyone, what is something going off the chart or the phrase practice what you preach what is something that you preach but find hard to practice oh what is something i preach but hard and hard to practice that is a good question right now i am deepening my embodiment for self-mastery as a leader it's something i do walk with leaders in is self-mastery with their mindset and their emotional intelligence and being powerful in the work they do. And I am noticing how I'm being called to elevate at a higher level. And so with that, it's requiring more self-mastery. And so I would say right now, currently, it's me walking with the duality of teaching this and walking with others as I'm leading myself in this area. Yes, amazing, amazing. Always trying to up-level, always trying to upgrade ourselves. Thank you so much for being here. Could you please tell the listeners how to find you? Yes, I'm all over these internet streets. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, I, I tend to hang out the most on Facebook and Instagram, though. And I'm doing something really, really crazy. I'm doing a 365 day real challenge on Instagram. And so if you want to just get to know me better and see what I'm about, I'm kind of putting little bits and pieces of who I am in the reels. And so you can connect with me there, too. But I also have a free community on Facebook, The Empowered Self. And yeah, Facebook and Instagram is where I hang out the most. I am on other platforms like YouTube and TikTok, but I would say Facebook and Instagram is where you can find me the most. Fantastic. And I will leave all of her information in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here today. And we wait time to see you.